Alrighty guys, let's make a start. Okay, hope you're all feeling nice and full from lunch and all relaxed. I, know I, sure, I, I sure am. Okay, so this is developing for the web in 2013. So creating high DPI websites. So if you're in the wrong room, you know, now's the, now's the chance. No? Okay, all good. Cool, okay. So I'll introduce myself. My name's Tim Oliver and I'm from Edith Cowan University in Western Australia. Um, let me just put that in perspective a bit more. Boom, there we go. <laughs> and animation done. Um, East, um, East is a little university. We're still starting out a little bit. Um, we're probably the newest university in Western Australia. Um, and I'm from the department that looks after all the, the learning software. So I'm from the Learning Center. So our main, our main piece of software we use for all the learning content is Blackboard. Um, and I'm on the uh, user support team for that, as well as testing out new technologies we use for learning, um, which is really cool. We just rolled out a new piece of software called PebblePad. I wonder if anyone else has heard about PebblePad. Yep, it's pretty good. It's really good. Yeah, so it's, it's a cool little, little place we were at. We get to try out new toys, and yeah, we get to help people learn better. Alrighty, so what we'll be covering today, um, let's go through a few things. So, who here has never done iOS development? Oh, blimey, okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, everyone's done iOS development then. Right, so I'll just be going quickly then over the concept of high DPI, what it actually means in terms of hardware, and then how it actually works in terms of translating that to software. Um, how to set up a test platform, so if you don't have a high DPI uh, computer yet, which I don't, so yeah, <laughs> that's just mainly for my benefit. Um, how to actually set up some alternative compromises you can use to actually test your content on a high DPI without actually having the hardware. Um, some of the good techniques, uh, there's a lot of techniques right now, this, there's, this is not standardized whatsoever, so there's many different ways of doing this, so I'll go through some of the ones I've discovered and some of the ones that Apple's been talking about. And then at the end, I was kind of in my hotel room last night going, there's, there's really actually no best practice. Every, every way kind of sucks in some regard because it is still brand new and there's no standardized methodology for it yet. So I'll talk about some, some ways you can minimize inconsistencies and like that, but yeah, we'll see how we go. Anyway, let's start off. That's my lens for that question for the, the talk. It's been a pretty big year for Apple, hasn't it? Like back in early March, I think it was, they announced the, the new iPad, not the iPad 3, but the new iPad. Um, I was actually, on a side note, I was actually in San Francisco at the time attending GDC and it was mad. Like I was just walking down the street and I was like, past the, the center where they announced it, there was this news vans up and down. Every hotel in the block had been booked out for weeks. Um, I actually had no idea when, when Apple actually announces something, it is, it is massive, it is huge. And yeah, don't try and live in San Francisco when it happens, <laughs> we'll stay away. Um, and then at WWDC this year, they also announced uh, a, a new paradigm of computing technology, and that was the Mac MacBook Pro with Retina display. Um, I was also there for that as well. I was actually very fortunate enough to get an AUC scholarship for that. So I was, <laughs> we got up at 3.30 a.m. in the morning to, to camp outside the convention center to get in to see that thing. Um, and I still remember when Phil Schill actually unveiled it because it was deathly silent in there. He's, he's just hovering over it, like pointing at it, and he just goes, yeah, it's Retina. And like the whole room just lost it, like for five minutes, just crowding and cheering, and it was, it was nuts. I think I lost a bit of my hearing in that. Anyway, back on topic again. So I'm going to say this is probably quite pos uh, a paradigm shift here, because these two products introduce something that has been around for a little bit, um, but now is bringing it way right into the, the mainstream. That's the Retina display. Um, and if you're curious where that picture's from, I, I was looking around Google. That's actually an iStock photo you can get for 20 bucks. It's obviously you know, real, a real premium piece of artwork. But yeah, anyway. So like I just said, we've had um, retina displays on, on other devices um, for a while now, 2010. Um, who here actually has a new iPhone? Bah, okay. Um, but yeah, but uh, what I'd like to go on record in saying is um, while these things were retina, they're not really mainstream content consumption devices. They're the kind of thing you pull it in your pocket, pull out, check, and go, yep, that's cool, and put it back in. But because the screen size is so small, it's not really a serious content creation, uh, consumption device. And as a result, even the content, even if it's not Retina compliant, because it's so small, it'll look crispy anyway. So just on that note, um, uh, I, f I follow a nice chap on um, Twitter called Marco Arment. He's, um, he makes this tiny little app called Instapaper. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, uh, he basically went on record saying straight after um, WWDC, if you're a web designer, you really, really need to get a Retina MacBook Pro so you can see how bad your site looks on it and then fix it. Um, and that was funny because then he got, you know, destroyed by trolls saying, well, you know what, there's more people using IE6 right now than Retina MacBooks. Should I make my site IE6 compliant as well? And to which he actually wrote a blog post saying that even though it's a small market today, it's going to get increased. It's going to increase substantially, and do you want to get ahead of that? Like, he's right. So, you know, IE6 is dying. Hopefully it's dying. Oh, please, God, is it dying. Um, 
But Retina MacBooks are only Retina compliant, high DPI technology is just going to get increased. And we've only got two at the moment. I can probably bet that the next line of, of like iMacs and Apple Simmer displays and the other Macs Apple makes, Mac Minis, no, they don't have screens. Um, yeah, they're all going to be Retina probably within the next year, maybe two years. All righty. So what exactly is high DPI? I love that picture. So just to, just to, go, just to go, go back and actually start from, from the beginning, just in case you, you, you aren't an iOS developer and haven't been doing this for the last two years. Basically, a Retina display, if you picture a normal uh, LCD display zoomed up, basically you've got a grid of pixels. Now, the only difference between a, a non-retina display and a retina display is each pixel has then subsequently been subdivided into, that's one pixel, yep, subdivided into four smaller pixels. So the physical size of the LCD panel hasn't actually increased whatsoever, but suddenly it's become a lot more dense. Where, the, where there was one pixel, there's now four. Um, so basically what that means is the actual resolution of the device doubles. So if you go through and look at all, all the devices that do retina right now, you've got the, 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 new, the new resolution iPhone and iPod Touch, not the old one. You've got the iPad, which was released this year. And the Retina MacBook Pro is a bit weird because it doesn't actually have a, a, a complete doubling. There's actually many resolutions you can, you can scale between. But the native uh, display resolution is 2880 by 1800. Anyway, so, so you've got, this, you've got a, a system where the resolution's been doubled, right? And you're, you're probably thinking, well, that's really cool. Now I have twice as much space to put stuff. Well, it doesn't actually work like that. Because if you actually did a one-to-one -one pixel, uh, like content pixel to display pixel, everything would be really freaking tiny. Like, like text, is, text would be so small you can't actually read it. Like these pixels are so tiny. If you were to just render, use a normal rendering context, it would be that small. Um, and I, I have a, a few crazy, crazy mofo friends who tried this, and they said they actually started getting headaches and eye strain, and that they, yeah, it was actually damaging their health. So it's, this is not how it actually works. So I'm going to use another anvil, just because I can, because this, 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 these two letters appear a lot, quite a bit. The content is also scaled up by two, so 2x. Yeah, I know. Okay, fine. I'll do it next time. Okay, but basically, so so the, the pixel red density is doubled, and then the actual size of the content is doubled. What's the point of that? Isn't that a bit redundant? Well, what's happening actually is content then subsequently is still the same size physically on the screen, but now that there's more pixels to work with, it actually defines the the, the pixels a lot more nicer. Everything becomes a lot sharper, a lot more legible. Um, depending on the device, if it's over 300 dpi, it's actually crisper than printing out on paper. It's, it's really nice. And when, when you've got IPS displays, you can look at it from the side like that, it looks really shiny as well. It looks almost like paper. There's a little arrow in there. Anyway, so that's, that's, that's the demonstration of text. I also have this lovely uh, website of one of my favorite TV shows. It doesn't, oh, it doesn't really work on the projector, but as you can see, you've got <laughs> <laughs> everything's blurry on the projector. So that's, that's non-retina, that's non and then you've got retina. As you can see, it's very subtle. But just even, even on like small, small devices, it makes a world of difference because text that's really tiny now becomes a lot more legible. You don't actually have to zoom in anymore. Um, we still do a little bit, um, but it just looks a lot nicer. Okay, so how does this actually work? Now, if, if, if you actually think about it, we've doubled the, 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 the screen resolution. Doesn't that mean we actually now have a, a new, screen, uh, a new um, coordinate system we have to support? Uh, so for example, if we have this one singular pixel at coordinates 128 by 64, one pixel. Surely, if you had the same pixel cluster, that's that pixel, that new so, tinier pixel, it's in the same area. Wouldn't that, you know, logically be double the resolution of what it was before? Um, yes, it would be. But Apple introduced this paradigm in their Retina displays that actually fixes this. And what they've actually done is they've killed that concept, and they've introduced this concept of points. So before we had one pixel, that cluster of four pixels now is, re is represented as a point. And you'll see this this term in the in the documentation quite a lot: pixels versus points. Um, in pretty much every single iOS talk at WWDC, they just use points exclusively. So a point means, a point means that um, you reference those four chunks of pixels, and you don't actually get control over each individual pixel, which is really good, because otherwise you would get, you would get really weird inconsistencies, um, especially when you're scaling back from a retina to a non-retina display. Um, but yeah, that's basically how it works. So when I say point, just realize I'm, I'm, using, I'm, re I'm referring to one non-retina pixel. Okay. And finally, so I, just, I kind of just switched from high DPI to Retina here. Um, the difference between um, the two is that Retina is Apple's act actual branding marketing term for high DPI display. So Apple actually uses this specifically for their own um, marketing purposes to, to um, what's, what's, the, what's the buzz, what's the catchphrase? A, a display that, what was that? Differentiates themselves. That, that, yes. But the, 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 marketing, the marketing catchphrase is a Retina display is a, is a 
a device where the pixels are so small together, your human retinas can't distinguish them. And that's where it came from. Um, and I heard from a few app developers that it's actually, and I actually, after that, I actually went on to the trademark office to look this up, that it's actually a trademark term by Apple in relation to computer displays. So if you use that word and you're not Apple, um, and you name a product after it, they will come after you with a bloody vengeance. Um, so just heads up. It's in interesting to note that actually that, that trademark actually went through just before the iPhone 4 was announced. Um, and I've done a bit of trademark registrations. You usually have to do it like at least a year in advance. So they were, they were working on that for a while from the looks of it. But yeah, anyway, Rand equals Apple, high DPI is everyone else. Although I'm going I'm to put it down right now. Samsung is totally going to make an ocular display. Totally. <laughs> yep. Just to sum up, um, high DPI displays. The display with the, they're the same physical size, but with a greater um, pixel density. So it's basically, um, yeah, the same same size, but with more pixels. Um, it is so the physical re resolution is doubled, but at the same time the content is also doubled. So physically you're not actually gaining any more space, but you're getting better definition, and that's it. So the, the resolution is kept constant, which is really nice when you actually having to transmit between two types of displays. And from now on, I'll try and keep this in mind, um, it's referred to as points, not pixels, just because now you've got a, a, like a, a disjoint between physical pixels and, and display pixels. Alrighty. So how do you actually set something up? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, going, how do you do this kind of thing? Um, so first things first, you can use a Retina MacBook Pro. Who here actually has a Retina, Mac, Retina MacBook Pro? <laughs> nice, Josh. <laughs> Get him! <laughs> okay. All right, so that's what I thought. So they are shiny. They're very shiny. Um, when it came out, every single person in my like, close circle of developer friends went out and got one. I'm the only one with a big, clunky MacBook Air over there. Um, yeah, because it's, you know, it's just so big and clunky. <laughs> yep. Um, but yeah, basically, if you go, if you really, if you, like, like Marco Arment said, if you're really serious about web development, you're probably going to have to do yourself a favor you know, and buy one of these. It's native hardware, so you're testing directly on, on what the consumers will be looking at your content on. There is no setup. Um, with the other two I'm going to mention, there's a slight bit of setup and a lot of setup, um, which you might have to do. Um, probably the killer feature about this one is you can actually test multiple browsers. Um, so things like the, the Retina iPad, they're, they're all primarily or predominantly or completely WebKit based. So you can't do Firefox testing, which is Gecko renderer based. Um, and finally, this might be up and down, like you can actually test your performance. If you've got dynamic code like JavaScript and all that, you can actually realistically check how well it's working, um, which the other two might not really work. That being said, they're expensive. They're really expensive. <laughs> so you might end up like this guy. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird because they, they are the flagship product of Apple now, so they are probably the, highest, the most expensive laptop you can get from them. Um, and since you can't actually upgrade them, whatever you get in them initially is what you're stuck with until you get a new computer. So that might even mean you have to upgrade a bit more from the base model. So, like me, I just I bought that that MacBook Air like November last year. So it's not even a year old yet. So I really can't justify buying one. I want one so badly, but I can't. So if if you're like me, um, there's a few other solutions we can do. And the next one, obviously, would be the Retina iPad or the new iPad. I call mine my the new iPad, just to you know, because that's apparently what it's called. So the new iPad is it came out in March. It is pixel. It is Retina display as well. It is alternative native hardware, so it's still, it's still a bona fide retina display. You can test out your content on it to make sure it looks nice. It's all scaling properly. It's not smudgy or, or broken. Um, there is a small amount of set setup. Um, I was testing out one of my sites on this and found out there is actually a bit of a, a, bit of a tiny, like one line of code you have to implement to actually get to, to work properly, um, which I'll go into next slide. Um, it's WebKit browsers only. Um, there is, what is it, Opera? I think it's Opera. That, so it's a third party app that does. Um, it does actually do website rendering, but I think it's off the iPads. It doesn't technically count. It's like off, offloaded onto a server and rendered there and then sent back as a picture. Um, so you're basically limited to WebKit browsers. That's Chrome and Safari, um, not Firefox, and certainly not Internet Explorer. <laughs> Internet Explorer. Um, so yeah. And, oh, sorry, sorry. and it, is, it is slower than, you know, than obviously than a core i7 you know, Intel chip, but at the same time, that might be a good thing because if, if you get it to run smoothly on this thing, it'll run pretty smoothly on pretty much anything. Alrighty, so what was I talking about when I said there's a little bit of setup? Well, this is, this is what happened when I was actually working on one of my websites. I made a, t a, test, a little test site, Anvil. Um, basically really simple, just a gray background and a single 400 pixel wide div in the center. Um, that's it. 
Um, the problem, though, with iPads or even with just touch devices is they want to make sure they're using up as much like usable screen space as they can. And since you can zoom in and out with them, usually the first thing it'll do is it'll try and find out the absolute minimum it needs to be and then zoom in on that. So this is slightly exaggerated, but this, this happens. So on an iPad, th that 400 pixels will be magnified, zoomed in, so it'll fit properly. Um, Tumblr blogs do this quite a bit. Um, and that's bad because now it's zoomed in, so suddenly if you've got retina content on it, you're actually looking at it zoomed in and it might look blurry even though it's supposed to be at the right size. Um, so there's a really good way to fix this. Um, I took a little bit of Googling to figure this out. There's this one line of code you can stick in the header of your HTML. It's just a little bit of mobile specific code. You say meta name equals viewport, content width equals 1024. And initial scale is optional. But what that actually does is that's, uh, that's setting it, saying no matter how thin the content is, by default make it so that the, vis the, the default content size on the iPad is 1,024 pixels, which just happens to be the same number of points on the Retina iPad. Um, and then you'll get that, and that looks good. So that's, that's, that's one to one point to, no, pick, hang on, let me get straight, content pixel to point ratio. So that will look perfect, perfect, and when you do your testing on that, that'll look fine. Okay, so beyond that, what else can you do? If you don't have an iPad, you never have a Retina MacBook, you're completely retinaless, including your eyeballs, not really, you're screwed. No, you're not. That was a joke. You're not screwed. There is one more thing. Um, well, that's kind of, you know, you know uh, it's almost been uh, one more week will be the anniversary, the first year anniversary of Steve's death, so I thought that would be appropriate. You know. Too soon? <laughs> the total neck, too? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so, one more thing you can do. There's this lovely little app called Xcode. Has anyone not heard of Xcode? Oh, we do have someone who's not heard of Xcode. Wow, okay, you're missing out. Xcode's great. It's got its own like, Tumblr and everything. Um, <laughs> what was it, text from Xcode? Um, so just in case that there is anyone non-initiated, Xcode is the tool that you use to actually build Mac and iOS apps on the Mac platform. It's a free download off the Mac App Store. Just go into the Mac App Store and hit Xcode, and you'll find it straight away. It's got like a one and a half star rating, I think. I'm, I'm sure they're lying. Um, and basically, it's free to download, it's, it's a gig and a half, but we don't actually want Xcode itself. There's a little tool that comes with Xcode that's really good for debugging iOS apps, and that's called the iOS Simulator. Um, the iOS Simulator is just, it, it's a little tool that lets you compile your apps for x86 architecture and then run them lo locally on your Mac for the purpose of not having to keep deploying to your device to actually test it. Now it works on iPhone, it's one of the apps I made last year, and it also works for iPad simulation, and this is just on a side note, this, this app, so I just finished this, this one's called iComics, it's on sale right now for free if you want to get it. It came up this morning during the keynote. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, anyway, <laughs> just a short little plug there. Okay, anyway, so the iPad version of the iOS simulator actually has a built-in version of Safari, so a simulated version of the mobile Safari that comes on iOS, and at the same time, you can also display your content, uh, you can also set the, the window to be retina-sized. Um, now that being said, a retina-sized iPad in terms of normal pixels is big. It is really big. Um, last year I bought a 30-inch monitor um, for my design work. Um, I had to spend a lot of time justifying it to myself that I needed one for my design work. Then I'd spend twice as much time justifying it to everyone else that I wasn't compensating for anything. Um, <laughs> getting more of that huge. But that's the size of a retina iPad on, on a normal display. So it's basically the size of a 30-inch monitor, which is ridiculous. Um, that being so, so if you, if you don't have a 30-inch monitor, um, you can actually scroll around with it. You can actually render it at native resolution and still scroll around. It's a bit finicky, but it works, and you can see your content, see if your content's working properly in a WebKit environment. Um, it's really good. Anyway. Okay, so this is where, if, if you don't want to actually open up Xcode, because normally to open the simulator, you have to usually build an app within Xcode, but if you want to just get to the simulator, once you've installed um, Xcode, you, it's in the Applications directory. You scroll down to the bottom, next to X. You right-click on it, or Control-click on it, or Secondary-click on it, and choose Show Package Contents. And then from within there, it's just a, a quick little drop-down to the iPhone Simulator app. And once you open that up, you'll just get a, a window like, like an iPhone on your screen, and you can actually just access content through Safari, just like it's a normal website. Um, so that's iOS Simulator. A giant screen again. Um, it works in a pinch. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend it if you can do something else, but it does work, and it is free, which is the most important bit. You don't have to pay anything. No doubt. Well, you have to buy a Mac, I guess. But apart from that, it's free. Um, the monitor resolution is a, a slight issue. Like, I can't rotate portrait mode. Portrait mode is too freaking huge for a 30-inch monitor. 
So um, it is a bit of finicky because you have to sc scroll around quite a bit on, on depending on your monitor. Um, and it is slow. Like Apple did not care at all about performance of this thing. So it is chuggy as, as all heck. But that might just be because I'm trying to run 30 inches off a MacBook Air. Um, but yeah, it is chuggy to the point where if you're trying to do any like benchmarking or scaling, it probably won't be realistic. That's it. That's setting up a test platform. So we have the shiny Retina MacBook Pro, which is probably the best solution. Failing that, you've got the, iP the new iPad, and then finally you've got the 30 inch monitor. Alrighty. So, what are some techniques we can do? <laughs> okay, so I, was just, I, I went through all the slides at WWDC, and I did a lot of testing on my own website, and I did a lot of research on Google. Um, there's a lot of techniques, some of them are really awesome, and some of them are just face palm worthy. Okay, yeah. Um, this is, a, this is a forum um, skin I've been working on. I, have a little, I run a little group called Uber Games, and I'm just in the m m middle of reskinning the, the forum software. So I thought this would be a really good chance to try out some Retinacore at the same time. Um, I made a similar skin back in 2007, and that was terrifying. I'm trying to forget that, um, just because it's so much easier to make dynamic code and, and scalable content these days than back then. Back then, it was all like animated GIFs and not, not even PNGs and the likes. OK. so. Straight off the bat, HTML, there is actually nothing changed in HTML. That, that might, there's nothing, nothing standard yet, nothing at all relating to IDPI displays. That might be a good thing. That might not. Actually, it's probably not a good thing, because there's, there's a few tricks in CSS that can't be done with CSS just yet. You might, you might want native HTML code. Um, but so with that in mind, all the, all the measurement values in HTML, um, like table width and all that, uh, they're, 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 they're equivalent to one point. So there's no, you don't have to do any, any changes to that. That being said, you probably shouldn't be putting raw pixel values in too much in HTML code, because that's what CSS4 is, right? Right. The only one I can think of is maybe the image tag. OK. So CSS, CSS is really good. Um, most of CSS actually works really well. Like, basically, here is a, um, two versions of one of the buttons I, I, I made entirely in CSS. One of them is on the non-retina above, and the other one on my, my MacBook Air, and the one below is on my, the new iPad. Um, but as you can see, that's all CSS. I didn't actually you know, rescale, rejiggy, or do anything. That's all completely out of the box CSS. Um, the great thing about that is one CSS pixel, the PX value in CSS, is equivalent to one point. So there's no, no shif shifting of values at all. One, one pixel will actually translate straight to one point. Um, it, and that being said, it will handle 99% of the code, but there are a, a very few small styles that do actually change depending on. Um, the type of display you're on, so you might actually have to have, what, uh, you might actually use one we're actually going to introduce next. So just keep that in mind. Like the, what's a good one? The slices property of the image-based borders that that can't handle that can't handle automatic translation between Retina devices. So that you actually need to do um, manual tweaking. Um, as you can see, text will render differently. Like my my Chrome is rendering using sub sub pixel rendering there. So you've got the nice rainbow effect, um, and the real iPad doesn't. Doesn't give no, does not care about that at all. So it's just completely out of the box rendering. So Marco was pointing this out on his blog as well. It's quite possible that when you switch to a Retina display, your font, your your choice of font might start to look kind of funky. It might look a lot more blocky or a lot thin. It might screw up what your visual style was. So keep that in mind that when you're testing, make sure that the font still looks consistent. And if not, you might have to change. I think one one notable thing was it, when Apple unveiled the iPhone 4, they actually changed the. Um, the, font, the default system font from Helvetica to that weird one, Helvetica Noir, I think it is, or Nui. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. <laughs> it's the new Helvetica. New. new? It's just new? OK. There you go. Hel Helvetica New. Thanks, Josh. OK. So yeah, just keep that in mind that even though CSS will work out of the box, there will still be visual inconsistencies that you might need to keep an eye on. OK. And on that note, there's this cool new thing called CSS Media Queries. And this is something that was pimped out at WWDC quite a bit. So if you do find yourself requiring a case where um, non-retina displays will require a certain set of styles and retina displays require a different set of styles, you can use this bit of code. So basically what that's saying is at media is, is the keyword to actually say this is media query. Screen is to denote that you're actually doing this for a screen context, but you can also do it for when you're printing out to paper, but that's irrelevant here. And then this, in this case, we've got for Gecko and WebKit renderers, you've got the min device pixel ratio and I think it's cut down. It has to be two. Yeah, it's been clipped off, sorry. At the very end, it says two on the black strip up there. <laughs> and max MOS device fixed ratio is two. So that's basically saying that the, the content scaling has been being scaled up by two. 
So any high, high DPI styles you require can go in this block. Um, so that actually allows conditional appending or overriding of styles depending on what display you're using. Um, and this is something cool that was highlighted in WWDC. Here's, here's a scenario you might not have thought about. If you've got a Retina MacBook Pro and it's plugged into a non-Retina Apple Cinema display, what happens if you drag a, a, a website from a Retina display onto a non-Retina display? And the answer is WebKit specifically, I'm not sure about Gecko, can actually detect this and will actually refresh the page and rejig the, the, the code depending on what context you're transitioning to. So it will actually like, like swap out retina assets and put in non-retina assets and all that, which is really cool. Half on, half off. Um, I don't know. I haven't, actually, I haven't tested that yet. I'm assuming yeah, so half on, half off. Yeah. 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 I think that's about right. I've, I've had it with like color profiles on certain windows. We're changing between windows. So you'd be like, it'd be like kind of bluey, 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 green all of a sudden, kind of, yeah. Which is really cool. And um, one thing that needs to be highlighted, these media query blocks need to go after the default non-retina code. If you do it beforehand, then what happens is the retina code will be applied, but then because CSS is cascading, the non-retina styles will then be applied back on top of that. So you have to make sure the ordering is, is in the right, the right way. Otherwise, you're going to have non-retina content all the time. And JavaScript. Now, JavaScript is if you want to actually do, you might want to be doing, you might be making a game, or you might be making some, something that requires a lot of dynamic rendering and, and processing. You, there is a little um, property in the window um, object that you can choose that says, if the device pixel ratio is greater than 1, then you can perform high DPI relevant operations there. And that's really cool, because then you can actually start to stream down dynamic content and the likes um, and, and all of that. Um, and out of the box, though, it can't detect those, what I was saying before, those context changes. It can't detect that. But there is actually another line of code. You can register a, a callback function for that. Um, so basically, you just say, watch for, watch for when this property changes. And when it does, fire this function. And so you can actually then do, and this is actually, I'll talk about this a little bit. This is actually how Apple handles the, the retina content on their website. All right. So the bane of retina displays, unfortunately, is images. Um, there's no way to upscale, take an image, and then magically make a retina version. There's no way to do that. In fact, if you, here's, here's a zoom-in version of the part of the logo I, I designed, which is a very original logo. As you can see, oh, it doesn't actually, yeah, projector. The, the, retina, the top is non-retina, the bottom's retina. As you can see, it's actually scaling it up, and it's also doing some, sa some blurry sampling at the same time. So you're getting, you're getting the same. Um, this, the same pixels, and it's, it's, it's turning into a blurry mess. It looks really bad. So images don't scale. And this is the same with iOS app development. Um, in iOS app development, you usually have to supply two, ass, two sets of assets for each um, graphic. Um, they do interpolate. On iOS, on iOS apps, they don't interpolate. So if you, use a, uh, if you only have non-retina assets, they actually appear really blocky. But in WebKit rendering, since I'm guessing it's OpenGL or something to that end, they do actually interpolate, but it does look kind of really, really bad. So images do not scale, and they will, they, they, they will require extra effort, um, sadly to say. So what can we do to actually fix this? Well, there's actually quite a few solutions. This one's the cheap and nasty way. This one's terrible. I, I feel dirty. Like, I feel like buying a kebab after drinking all night dirty doing this solution. But it works. Um, and it's, it's probably the main one for, for instance, we don't have direct access to the CSS or the JavaScript of a website. So if you're posting on a forum or a blog or something like that, this is what you can do. You make the retina version of your asset. Um, and then you just stick it in an image tag. So if the, if, the, if the retina asset is 628 by 70, you just say insert image and then say it's, so that, that's, and then say it's point size. So we're talking about 314 by 35, literally half, half the resolution. Um, and WebKit is smart enough to realize that you're doing that and will actually scale it down and then keep the extra detail so you actually end up with a retina quality um, image in your website. Unfortunately, well, actually, I'll, I'll get on that a little bit, but that's, that's, that's good. That's very simple to implement. Um, it requires no extra code, pretty much, no, no funky JavaScript or queries or anything. But sadly, what that actually means is your, your, your users are loading a retina website whether they want to or not. So we're talking about literally twice the amount of detail for no gain at all. So it's very bandwidth inefficient. Um, and in addition to that, uh, certain browsers, like I'm not going to mention any, Internet Explorer, 
they, they can't do sampling, downscale, downscaling very well. So if you're, if you're sending down a giant image and then, I'm getting tweets, and then sending down, and then actually trying to scale it down locally, most, um, apart from it being a memory drain, um, most, most browsers can actually resample it so it looks okay, but some might, might not, and so you're gonna get like really jagged looking graphics, it'll just look really bad, and performance, scrolling performance might even be an issue. You might end up killing like certain old browsers as well. Um, so that's, that was the first solution, that's the cheap and nasty one. Um, there is another one, we've got CSS media queries. You guys have like a Twitter discussion here, and it's popping up on my iPhone. Um, CSS media queries, so here's, here's one that's probably the, like the nicest, but it's, also, it's still got some pitfalls. So we go back, we make a retina version of the logo or the asset and a non-retina version. We've got two versions. And then in CSS, you can just make it like a, a background div. So we just, stick, we just make a div called logo and we, stick, we just say that the div is manually the, the, the point size, the non-retina pixel size, and then specify that the background image is the non-retina version. And then you perform a media query and then you encapsulate another block for that same div and just insert the, the retina version of that same asset. And you don't actually have to redefine the width and the height because that can be carried over from the non-retina version. You're just, you're just specifying that there's a new high, re high definition version of the logo that you have to use in its place. Okay. So we'll go back to that. So, oh, that's right. Um, and finally, after that, um, from that point, um, at WWDC, uh, the, the, the WebKit evangelists were saying that they, they, they think that's going to be called quite a bit. That, that kind of code is probably going to be bread and butter, like for a lot of, lot of, like a lot of website frameworks and, and the likes. That will probably be called a lot. And as you saw, it was a pile of code. So if you want to do that for every single image in your website, that's going to be a lot of redundant text, which is a bit sad. So they're actually pushing, working on this right now. They want to introduce a new standard to uh, CSS. Looks like this. The idea is you actually specify one block without having to do any media queries, and you can actually specify for the background image, depending on your pixel scale context, which asset to use. So that, that, cuts, that cuts down like what? What was that? 10 lines of code, possibly more, down to basically two or three, which is really cool. Get back to that. Cool. So that's CSS media queries. Um, and here we go again. So this is nice because it doesn't waste bandwidth. Um, it, it basically it loads the CSS first, and then it actually loads down the assets based on your device after that. So you're not actually downloading redundant assets or anything, or even you know assets that you don't require but are really big. Um, it can handle multiple context switching, like I was saying before. So that's really good. So when you do you know move your window between certain uh, monitors, it will automatically handle your your reapplying of, con of um, uh, graphical media. Um, here's the kicker though, doesn't work for image tags. So you have to use a div every time. You can't apply that to image tags. Um, so all of a sudden either, so either you can't use it for image tags or you could just make every single image on your website a div. But then the next problem with that is that will kill accessibility because then you can't include alt tags and divs. So all of a sudden now you, you can't, you've got a website that can't actually be traversed by, a, by an accessibility crawler very well. Um, there are hacks for that. Um, there's the ability to actually hide, what is it? You can hide a span tag inside the div and make it invisible. So it technically works. You can actually say if, if CSS or if images are disabled, you can still have con uh, some kind of description saying what used to be there. But it's probably not really recommended and, and it's, it's not, that's probably like not supported functionality for a lot of crawlers. So um, since I work in, in the government um, institution, like all universities are basically government institutions, um, it's mandated that we, all of our websites are accessible for people who might have impaired vision or the likes, or are actually just flat out blind. So this is a really huge concern. Okay, but yeah, so, and there's not, okay. And this is another one that I was, I was doing some more research. This is one I found on my own. Um, this could work. Um, dynamic content serving via CMS. So the idea is you, you still have two sets of assets, um, but when, you actually, when the user goes to load the web page, you can then extract their user agent from the request header, figure out what device they're using. So if they're using a, 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 the new iPad or a Retina MacBook, you can um, get that information and then dynamically serve the content back to them. So if, they're saying, if it says they're on that device, you can serve back retina content as opposed to non-retina content. And if it's any other device, you know, just serve down the normal content. Um, 
And this is pretty cool because it then means you can actually streamline content creation inside the CMS. Um, for example, WordPress, the, that blog software product no one's probably heard of, is now start, like there's a lot of plugins being made for WordPress that can actually streamline the adding of images to blog posts that can be made retina. So it, it actually handles the processing of, of a photo into maybe two separate versions, a retina and a non-retina version, and then the actual serving it back to users, all from within the CMS. Um, this would be better because now you can actually, you know, you can actually build the image tags dynamically and specify whether you want to use a retina or a non-retina um, asset. But as a result of that, as you can probably guess, um, multiple context switching wouldn't work because now you've, you've locked yourself to one asset. Um, anyway, so there's a few ways around this. I was trying uh, after looking at all that. I was thinking, I was just going, wow, there's there is no elegant solution for this at all. Um, so how does Apple do it? Because obviously Apple's marketing these things, so they have to make their website retina or else it looks silly. So I was actually going around looking for some blog posts, um, to, and I actually found a few on discussing on how Apple actually rolls their own retina content. It was kind of weird because um, I was I was on my iPad and I went to the Apple website. And I noticed that it loads non-retina, and all the content comes down non-retina and all blocky. And then once the, f the page finished reloading, then it actually, all, all the images snap to retina. I, said, I thought that was kind of weird. And so when I actually found, um, yep, yep, wait. when I actually found a blog post detailing what they actually do, um, I thought this was rather interesting and a bit curious. What they actually do is they make two versions of every, um, two versions of every asset. I've done this before. Um, and then when you actually download the page initially, it just serves down the non-retina version. So just the, the default one that will work on any display. Then, once the website has actually finished loading completely, it then actually calls uh, a block of code saying that the, the, the document has finished loading. And then it will actually do that check in JavaScript to see if it is a retina device. And if it is, it then starts to go down and re-download all the assets, as re all the retina versions of the assets one by one, and then inserting it into every tag that requires such media assets. Um, but in addition to that, and this, this might be a bit redundant, it actually, um, it actually, before it downloads it, it actually polls the server once with a request header just to see if there isn't a retina version of that asset exists. So it will say, does, does logo at 2x exist? And the, the, the server will poll back saying yes, and then it will actually pull down the information. So for every graphic on the website, it makes three requests. So it actually downloads the retina version, no, it downloads the non-retina version, then it makes a check to see if there is a, a retina version, and then it grabs the retina version. So that, that works, but it seems a, a little bit redundant. Um, so that's basically it. So um, it, will, it will work. It will allow graceful loading of non-retina and retina content, so it works. Like, it'll actually, it actual, it'll actually work, which is good. And it means you, can't, you don't actually have to change much of your code. You don't have to do any specific if cases in your, in your image text or anything. You don't have to dynamically generate HTML. Um, as a result, it's starting to appear in libraries like jQuery, so you can streamline this kind of process automatically. Um, it can still handle content changes, so then you can actually do the opposite. So when you detect a context change, you could then reload all the non-retina content and flip it back. But as you can see, that seems you know, only slightly dodgy, the fact that you're actually loading like, the content multiple times. So this is a, an insane amount of bandwidth that's probably being wasted. And I can see why Apple's marketing LTE now, right? Yeah. So I was actually thinking on top of that, this might actually work really well in tandem with CSS. So you could actually make all of your stock content in, in the, like the, the, the site design in CSS and use the, the media queries. I, I probably wouldn't use that Apple one just yet because it's not standardized yet, so only Safari uses it. Um, and to use that in tandem with CSS and then actually use, for everything else that you couldn't do with CSS, like the image tag, then actually use this, this, this dynamic JavaScript loading library for that. All right. So let me just sum up on that. Um, there's no immediate changes in HTML, which is really nice. Although there is that just that, that little knowledge that one pixel is one point, so that no need to change that at all. Most CSS will translate by default, but there are a few styles, and you'll probably just discover them on, on your way, um, which ones do not actually directly translate to retina devices, so which ones you will actually have to add specific um, conditions for. Um, in which case you can use media queries, which is really nice. It's a really efficient way of doing it. Um, you can make JavaScript context sensitive by registering for all events. And images are a challenge. They are a huge challenge. Um, 
obviously there is no perfect solution yet, um, but just remember this is still a brand new uh, space we're in. And hopefully, um, I'm, I'm really hoping that something will happen with HTML code itself that will let us implement like high and low resolution artwork. Um, that would probably be the easiest solution. But at the moment, there's lots to choose from. So basically, go with what you think works the best, what, what has the, the least amount of compromise. Um, and yeah, so I was just thinking about for best practice, what could you do? Well, you could just not use images. That would help. Um, and this is, this is heralding back to when I made my forum skin back in 2007 versus now. There's a lot of stuff in HTML and in CSS and just in web browser rendering in general that doesn't require the use of images. So for example, back in 2007, if I wanted to make a nice shiny button, I'd have to you know, load up Photoshop and actually make, um, make that button. Um, but now, all I have to do is create a div. I can, I can give the red rounded edges. I can give the red, uh, you know, give, give the button a nice shadow. I can give it a gradient. I can give it a nice little bevel, which is just another shadow that's set to inset. So you can actually have nested shadows, which is really cool. Um, you, you can also use that to make like an external bevel effect. But all that's completely dynamic. That's, that's not an image. That's not Photoshop. That's nothing. That's just straight up web code, which is amazing, because that means it automatically scales to retina devices. I don't have to lift a finger. It looks great. Um, another thing people like to do is they usually, they usually like to use for maybe like the, 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 the title or the header or the, ma the main menu on uh, websites. If they want to use a custom font, up until now, you've just had to you know, paint in Photoshop a menu out of, with, uh, with like, um, just you know, render out the font to a bitmap and then actually display that. But now there's this thing called web fonts, which is really cool. Um, so web font is basically, it, makes you, it lets you attach fonts to your website and as they're, as they're downloading the website, the font data is downloaded, and you can then dynamically generate uh, you know, text with that font, and it will be displayed you know, as, vec as vectorized data, so it's not a bitmap anymore. Um, there is, and that's really good, because that also scales straight away. Um, there is a little bit of a concern, though, because as you're actually using a font, um, there is licensing involved. So if you don't realize you're, you're actually infringing on someone's copyright by using a font, um, you could get in trouble. So a lovely little company, a small, a small startup that's next door to Apple called Google, um, has actually implemented this really cool thing called uh, google.com slash web fonts. And that's a huge list, about a couple hundred of fonts that they've made available specifically. Like there's no licensing involved. You can just jump on there, go through the list. And if you say, yeah, I like that font, it'll give you the CSS you need to actually start using that font straight away. It's just a little bit of code at the top of the CSS file. And then you can just say font family equals this custom font below. And there you go. And finally, this is one I didn't really look at, but there's also SVG. Now, that, the app was pimping out SVG quite a lot, but I, I've yet to really see SVG in mainstream use. Has anyone actually tried it yet? SVG? You have? Is it good, Josh? It's all right. It's all right? OK. Yeah, so you can always, you can always try SVG. Um, in, app, in, in WWDC, they were using it in the context of when CSS wasn't enough. Like if you wanted a button that had like really swirly edges or really frilly gradients or something that would not work in CSS, then you could defer to SVG. But um, you, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, um, I'm guessing. And there's got to be a reason why it's not being used in mainstream yet. Um, but that might be one to check into. It's probably going to come more into mainstream now as, as people want to start moving away from bitmaps. But um, oops, I locked my, oh, I locked my phone. Oh, I lost, lost control of the thing. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy. Uh, still looking. Uh-oh. Bugger. OK, let me just walk over here. You, you think so? Yeah, I'm thinking that must be it. Uh, oh, okay, SVG is was it scale, scalable vector group? It's basically like XML that renders a picture. So it's it's like another version of um, Flash or like um, AI. It's like it's like, it's, like, it's basically a vector you can render inside a web browser, and it look it, it's ASCII data, so it looks like text. It, it, it's like like she's saying, draw a circle, fill circle with color. So it's a lot of instructions to create vec vector imagery. All right, let me just do. I, yeah, I've killed it. OK. And that's it. Thanks for attending. <laughs> Any questions? Nope. Cool. I think we finished. Oh, yeah, we finished pretty much on time. Excellent. Cool. All righty. Well, if there's no questions, this is my email, my Twitter address, my Twitter account. So if you, have any, if you do have any questions, feel free to contact me anytime. That's a zero in the Twitter um, handle, not a O. I've had that question before. That's some other guy stole that one. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot, guys, and I hope you found something interesting today. <laughs>